All right. There we go. Let's see if we fired off yet. Here we go. Uh -oh. Is it up? Is it up? Let's see. No delay. There we are. We're live. All right. All right. Okay. There we go. Let's see if we a little slow in the reaction here. here. There we go. All right. There's a penantarage. Right. Okay. There we go. Let's see if we a little slow in the reaction here. There we go. Right. There's a I need a higher right. speed internet connection here. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Let's see if we <coughs> slow the reaction here. There we go. There's a penantarage. I need a higher right. speed internet connection here. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Let's see if we <coughs> slow the reaction here. There we go. There's a penantarage. I need a higher right. speed internet oh, connection more here. here. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Let's see if we can <coughs> slow the reaction here. There we go. There's a penantarage. I need a higher right. speed internet oh, connection more here. here. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Let's see if we can <coughs> slow the reaction here. There we go. There's a penantarage. Okay. All right, here we go. You hear me, Jerry? Yes, sir. All right. Welcome to the show. I got to figure out a better way to make that all share. I got to get someone to do it for me. It's a pain in the neck. <laughs> but that's the uh, the fee. We're going live. So, welcome to the show, Jerry. Jerry. Um, we met, um, it's got to be, what, about nine, ten months ago or something like that? When did you join Apex? Yeah, coming up on a year. Coming up yeah. on a year now, MDM. And uh, we instantly connected. Um, fellow car guy, so that's, uh, I'm always into cars, so that's uh, right up my alley. I've been, I was selling cars uh, when I was 14, 15 years old, so uh, it's a fun fact. Um, Marine, which is uh, near and dear to my heart. My grandfather was a proud Marine. I got a bunch of friends that are uh, proud Marines, and... Uh, Thank you for your service. Um, I don't know how you guys do it, but we thank you. And um, you got a uh, you got a pretty good history. I've heard some of your uh, um, your past, and uh, you've, uh, you've gone through a lot, and uh, you're up on top, which is uh, what we like to hear. So uh, let's just start out with who is Jerry? Oh man, that's a that's a big question. That's a big question, buddy. Your buddy Sam Smith asked me that one in one of his episodes, and it took me an hour, but I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> Streamlined. We had, to, we had to do another one because it was, it took so damn long because I just went deep dive into who I am. Streamlined. Uh, grew, grew up in a small farming community, was adopted when I was 18 months old, uh, extracted out of a volatile inner city environment found out later when i was 19 when i met my biological mother that that was the case um uh, grew up needing for nothing uh, middle class lower middle class family always had stuff um always had clothes on my back shoes on my feet food on the table uh but we really didn't have a, a lot but that was okay because you, you didn't expect a lot you know it's it's like a difference in mentality when you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth you have sometimes a lot of entitlement but um I, I wasn't but i'm grateful for that because it gave me a foundation uh, i was a really good athlete wrestler um i also wrestled on to, uh, that in common <laughs> hey head on yeah i went on to uh college on a scholarship wasn't ready mentally uh dropped out of college after a semester and then uh were any of us ready for college that. when it happened i don't know if any of us are ready for college when it happened <laughs> i was 17 when i graduated high school so it was like i, I just wasn't there yeah I um, rough had a lot of fun year. had a lot of fun went to ou ohio university nice. which is like used to be in the top three in party schools in the country so <laughs> <laughs> had a lot of fun there. there's that yeah <laughs> yeah dropped out 
worked with my dad for a year, watched a movie, Top Gun, decided I was going to go in the Marine Corps, <laughs> went in the Marine Corps. Uh, spent four years in the Marine Corps, wrestled for the Marine Corps. Oh, wow. I uh, did a tour in uh, Desert Storm back in uh, August of 90. Got out of the Marine Corps after that and went to college to wrestle. Two weeks after I got, I got out of the Marine Corps, I met my wife. We'll be married 30 years in June. God bless. And uh, crazy, amazing story there. Won't deep dive into that. But I graduated from college and I married, baby, mortgage, you know, the whole nine. I couldn't find a full-time job. So I got into the car business out of necessity. It was not something that I had chosen. I wanted to be a teacher and I wanted to uh, be an athletic trainer. I've got a sports men degree, education degree. But I uh, got into that out of necessity because I needed to put food on the table and pay my bills. You do what you got to do, right? And uh, found out I was pretty good at uh, sales. And uh, did very, very well and took a little hiatus in the insurance business, which um, if you've ever sold insurance, I know you sell real estate, so it's a different thing, but I sold natural know, gas for a while. So, uh, it's kind of a similar, uh, yeah. So yeah. an intangible is very hard to sell and, and that's what you're doing with insurance and investments. You're selling a future, uh, for maybe somebody that's a legacy. That's not even going to be around or you're not even going to be around to see it. Yeah. So that was a very stressful time. Um, top 10 stresses. If you ever Google it, find out what the top 10 stresses are. And, and I, I tackled like five of them in a matter of a couple months. I switched jobs. My wife quit her job. We had another baby. We bought a house and we bought two cars <laughs> all in a very short period of time. Yep, yep. And I'm like, come on, get on my back. I got this. I can do this. I'm a badass Marine. I'm all American wrestler, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm just, my ego was so strong. I figured I could handle it. Well, me and absolute Citron became very close during that time frame because I was not selling any insurance and my wife had no idea. And so <clears throat> I was pretty good at cards and I started gambling a lot uh, to the point where I was driving. My wife thought I was going to work. I was driving to a casino, <laughs> gamble, try to make money, try to provide. Um, I'm going to fast forward because that I got back in the car business, but the addiction never left. And that took me down a, a long road of uh, hidden secrets. I was, I was deceiving my family because I was hiding my addiction. Um, and eventually, I mean, it cost me, I, I've never put a pencil to it. I probably could estimate, but Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars I, I pissed away. Oh, yeah. On so the gambling or the drinking or both? <laughs> oh, both. They we've, were, I know we've all, we've all lost a lot of money on drinking. I mean, that's a, yeah, that's a very it's, common it's theme. Yeah. It, 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 was, it wasn't something that I was... I would, I would not think about gambling until I was drinking. So mm -hmm. it was like, if I wasn't drinking, I wasn't thinking about gambling. But, you know, it was like, okay. That was after I got back into the car business though. Before it was like, I was doing this because I needed to make money. And uh, then it all came crashing down. It, it was definitely um, divine intervention. I was driving to a casino at 2.30 in the morning and I would do this on the regular, man. I, I would That's wake crazy. up and, and my wife would be sleeping, my kids would be sleeping and I'd be like, I'm going, I'm going to the casino, grab a six pack of beer, jump on the highway, huh. drive 30, 40 minutes and gamble until it was time. I knew what time I had to go. I've got an internal clock. It's weird about timing. So I knew what time I had to go because I knew what time my wife was going to wake up. So then I knew how much time I needed to have to get back home. <laughs> Pretty calculated. Did she realize uh, you were missing or she'd sleep through it and wake up? She's a sleep hard sleeper, man. She didn't, she, if she did realize it, she didn't tell me, but, um, 
That's wild. This one night in particular where where the uh, the kick in the gut comes is uh, I was driving and I was one exit away from the casino to get my hit. And I came to realize after I got through this, because I did get through it, um, is I was chasing the hit. Hmm. I wasn't chasing the win. I was chasing the hit because I was a, I was a very, very successful collegiate athlete. I wrestled in like six or seven U S opens. I mean, I wrestled a lot and I was on a lot of big stages in that environment. And so that was my hit, hmm. you know, I didn't think about gambling when I was in college. I didn't think about gambling when I was yeah, in the Marine Corps. I didn't, I didn't think about that stuff then. Yep. Yep. But when I hung up my shoes and I was done, then I was trying to replace that hit with something and you sell enough cars, just like, you know, you sell enough houses. You, you just, it's, it's that euphoria isn't the same. Yeah. yeah you have the first time buyer and that's really cool and it's exciting for them, but it's not the same. Yeah. yeah. So I was chasing the hit. I get that. Definitely. So I'm one exit away from the casino and my at two 30 in the morning on a Sunday morning and my phone blows up and it's my oldest daughter. And I didn't want to answer the phone. You know, I was, I was overwhelmed with guilt, shame, embarrassment, all the things that you want to call off because I've been hiding this separate life from my family for a long time. And it was costing me a lot of money and costing them a lot of money and a lot of opportunity because my stress level was higher because I was pissing away money. You know what? All, all these things that I could have avoided had I not got into that, but that's what addiction does. Hmm. So I answered the phone. I didn't want to. And my daughter said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm turning around. Hmm. One exit away from it, getting my hit. I turned around. And that was it. You know, I was on Pedro Manessis's uh, podcast a while back, and he was talking about how I worked through that after the fact, because a lot of people that have addictions, they have, they struggle, they relapse, they, you know, they have other things that come back into play. Well, that kick in the gut or kick in the nuts <laughs> was strong enough, man, that it was just like, I decided right there, this was not going to control my life anymore. So that was cold turkey at that point? That was... No yeah. one. Cold Turkey. Um, have I been to the casino since? Yep. Is it call my name? Nope. Huh. Do I drink? Yep. Does it call my name? Nope. So I have, I have come to an understanding, uh, but I had to get to that point, call it rock bottom, whatever you want to call it. I had to get to that point before I could move forward. And my wife says it all the time. It had to happen. Now, is it and like then, an escape? So I see like sometimes when, when I'm, when I catch my addictions, it's, uh, I find sometimes it's the escape from the stress. Like I said, that hit it gets you, gets your mind out of shit. I, you know, I got to make money. I got to pay the mortgage. I got to, you know, I need, let me go out and so I'm, a, I'm a stress eater and addictive eater. I found myself at 305 pounds at one point going, what the hell am I doing? And then drinking goes along with that. The more I drink, the more I eat, the more I drink, the more I eat. And it becomes a vicious cycle. And again, same thing. I, I know I, I got an addiction to the hit. I got an addiction to the win the addiction to the success and when stuff isn't going right you tend to you know drown your sorrows right and, and escape well it's like a coping me mechanism yeah you know and and that was you know that again like i said before it i wasn't thinking about gambling until i started drinking and that's where i think the enemy knows your makeup hmm. and the enemy is like okay so if i can get this guy to drink couple beers and get a little buzz then he'll start to think about going to the casino and then we can do this and then i can take that from him yeah and and that's how that manifests because i've i've said for years where your mind goes your body follows and that can be a positive or a negative yeah 100 you know if, if you if you focus and fixate on some things that you want to accomplish positively in your life and you focus and fixate on that in your mind then it comes to fruition Definitely. or if you focus and fixate on going to drink and going to gamble your mind goes your body follows yeah it just it's, it happens yeah definitely i definitely see that that's uh someone's explained if you're uh, driving like in a race car in a nascar and you're going so fast that if you look away you lose it because you're taking your your eyes 
off the, you know, you're looking where you need to go, you know, 150 miles an hour ahead of you. If you look to the right, you drift to the right, and it's the same idea. It's uh, when you when you take your focus off off what's right in front of you, where you need to be, um, you drift. And, you're gonna track that way. Yeah, yep. you're gonna start tracking that way, and it's uh, definitely uh, definitely something. I said positive and negative. I, I agree with that 100. percent It's you know, but once once I walked away from the the that world, um, I was I was still I was successful even when I was in that. But I w I didn't have anything to show for it. I mean, on the surface, everybody thought I was oh man, but I was fooling everybody because I didn't have two nickels to rub together because I was blowing it all at the casino or mm -hmm. drinking. You know, yeah, yeah. so I was doing enough to make things happen, but we weren't thriving or, or getting ahead. So as soon as that happened and, the, and I and I got that kick in the gut, then that's when the shift changed. And then life started to really open up um, more and more clarity and uh, direction and what we want to do. But. But then in activating our purpose, when I say ours, my wife and I will be married 30 years, you know, in June. It's a so feat these days. I mean, in our American culture here, that's, uh, that's not yeah. the norm anymore, unfortunately. We, we want to just, um, and, and this is a reoccurring theme, and I don't want to sound cliche, but it's, it's true. It's who we are, um, is we want to have an impact on as many people as we possibly can. Um, and that's that's a daily chore, daily activity, a daily um, goal um, that we have. That I, I'm in front of a lot of people just like you every day, and every day I have an opportunity to add value to somebody else's life. Fire starts and, fire, right? That's what I say all the time. It's up to us yeah. to start that fire and everyone around us, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And and if you're a professional salesperson and you're watching and listening to this you know how to extract greatness out of people. Hmm. If you're if you're pretty good at what you do, you know, because most professional salespeople are chameleons and they can read the other person. <clears throat> and so then they can understand and ask the right questions to extract that greatness. And that's what I do on the regular. I have people sit in front of me and I, yeah, I sell cars, but a lot of times I don't even talk about the cars. I talk about them <laughs> because funny. I'm that's, trying to find that's out. That's how I sell real estate. I, we don't yeah. talk about the house. I talk about why are you selling this house? You know, how long have you been here? What have you done to it? What, you know, what are your experiences? And, and uh, we talk about life and we build a relationship and, you know, cause it's, you know, it's kind of hard to bring someone in your house and, you know, it's kind of intimate. So we build that relationship up and we build a little no love and trust. And then we can talk about selling the house. Let's figure out who each other are first before I sell you something, you know, and uh, I think it goes a long way. I like to know what they're about, how can I help them, and then they know what I'm about and know how I'm going to help them, and we win together. And it sounds like uh, your car technique is the same same thing. I mean, it's kind of interesting. Well, I think the difference, though, that maybe some of the listeners might take this wrong, but, you know, I'm sincere. Oh, 100%. 100%, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's the difference in having a career and longevity in this arena than just having a job and being a flash in the pan and being gone tomorrow is, is I, I truly mean what I say. I truly yeah. mean the questions I'm asking because I want to better them. Yeah. I want to better their lives. I want them to be a better human being, not just a bought a, a car or a house. Yeah. I want, I want to have a positive impact on their life 100%. that could potentially change the lives of somebody else that they interact with. I don't know. Yeah. I'll probably know when I go to heaven, but I don't know immediately. Oh, it's important. I've told people, listen, this isn't a house for you. I've told people not to sell. You know, people talking about selling a house, and now's not a good time. Don't sell. And I, I, after I talk to them about their situation and what's going on, I mean, I don't know. What other real estate agents, you know, that's not a good time to sell your house. Why don't you wait a year, and then we'll talk again. Because yeah. I care about them. I, why are you doing this? What's going on in your life? And, you know, all right, let's, let's, this isn't the right time. Let's talk in a year, you know, and. In the meantime, we'll do this, that, and the other thing. Cause it's and some people, some people listening to this or watching this might say we're fucking idiots, but I don't care. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. That's how I roll. You know, one of my core values is integrity. I do what I'm going to say. I'm going to. I do what I say. I'm going to do. But with integrity comes morals and ethics. Mm -hmm. And if you know 
in your heart of hearts that this is the wrong thing for this person to do and you're just doing it to them for a buck yep. you're a fucking idiot yep and and it's going to come back on you you know and it and it's wrong it's short-sighted and you're going to be that flash in the pan and you're going to be yep. gone because eventually you'll be found found out right so because wherever you go there you are yeah, hundred percent. I used to flip houses. People say, "Why do you, you know, why do you make it so nice? You're making them too nice." I said, first of all, you know, I my name is on this house now that I flipped. I want it to be something that I would be proud to live in, and that's of course makes it easy to sell. Because at the same time, I need to sleep at night. I need to know that I didn't cut any corners. That you know, someone's not going to move in this house and say, "Oh, this guy made a mess and he sold me this piece of crap." You know, I need to sleep at night knowing that I did the best I could and gave them the best product that I could. And at the same time. Now in, in my real estate sales role, I want them to tell all their friends and neighbors and family how I took care of them and how happy they are and how they should use me for their next real estate transaction. That's my goal. My goal is to get them to tell everyone how great I am, not how this guy screwed me over, this guy was just trying to make a buck. Um, and like I said, I take it personally when stuff goes wrong and sideways in a deal, I get upset about it because it's like I'm doing everything in my power to try and make this the best experience of their life. Um, you know, we all need the money, but I always said this started out as a second uh, career for me, a second job. So I didn't really need the money to live on. Um, it allows me to tell people walk away from the house or now is not the right time to sell. And I kind of got into that method of that's just how I operate. And sometimes I'm like, all right, this is the right thing to do. This is how we're going to do it. I'm going to hold your hand through every step. You know, I'm going to fix all the problems. And when the building department issue shows up and the whatever the, the title issue that shows up or there's a financing issue that shows up or whatever comes across in the deal, I'm here to hold your hand and make it, you know, and I try and warn them in advance potential things that may come up. Hey, listen, you know, you got a finished basement and it's not, you know, not permitted. This could be an issue. You know, you got a buried oil tank. This is probably going to be an issue. And this way, when it comes up, they're like, oh, I know you told us about this and it came up and now we got to deal with it rather than you getting hit in the head with a two by four. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden it's like, you didn't tell me about this. And I try and just break it to them, and you know, and I think by doing that and warning them of all the flags in advance, they uh, they appreciate that. And I think, you know, same thing with you. You probably walk them through every step of the way. You know, this is what's going to happen. You know, you're going to look at this car. You, you know, we're going to get a price. You're going to go into the finance office. They're going to do this. Then you're going to, you know, they're going to prep the car. You're going to pick it up tomorrow, whatever. And you walk them through each step. They feel comfortable with it. And they know what's coming, and they're not getting hit in the face by, oh, I didn't expect that. You know, I think uh, very similar ideas. Yeah, here, here's the reality. It's it's the difference between relationship and transactional selling. Yeah. And, and that that's the easiest way to put it. And the relationship selling is so much more fun. It is. It's so much more seamless. And it believe it or not, the profit margins are better. Hmm. Because like you referenced earlier, Brian, the no like and trust. I mean, if you have relationships established with people and they come in to see you they're, they're going to do business with you and they're going to trust you and you need to take care of them. I'm not saying to be deceiving in, no, I, in what your actions are or anything, but, but it's just the different, and that's what I teach in my sales training. I, I teach salespeople how to develop those relationships in different ways to develop those relationships. But the big thing has to be, you have to be sincere about it. 100%. You can't think that there's an agenda. You know, I'm, I'm going to develop this relationship because years yeah. ago when I started selling cars, it's like, okay, get them in the door and you're going to talk about their family and you're going to talk about everything else and talk about their kids and sell them, you know, and then pow, you're going to sell them a car. Yeah. You know, that that's, that's bad. Yeah. And that's what gave the reputation of the salesperson. Yeah, it gives us all a bad rep between, uh, like I said, car salesman, yeah, real estate, out. everyone thinks salesmen are slime, and I'm like, slime, I mean, like, I want to be your friend first. Like, literally, I, I want to be friends with you. And everyone's like, why do you want to be friends with your clients? I was like, because I love people, and if they're cool people, after this thing, I want to go to dinner with you, and, you know, maybe we'll come over to the family party and stuff, because we spent a couple months together trying to sell your house or buy a house. Like, truly, you know, most of my clients that are still local, you know, we see. I had a client the other day. I was stopped in a local uh, neighborhood wine bar over here, and I was talking to uh, another friend of mine. I didn't realize they were at the bar, and all of a sudden they sent me a drink down from the end of the bar. Like, my client said I sold them a house two years ago, saw me at the bar, and sent me a drink. I mean, it should be the other way around, but 
I was like, this is this is why I do this. This is, you know, I enjoy this part of it. I enjoy the relationships I build. I enjoy the people. I even enjoy some of the other real estate agents, you know, most of them, I should say. You know, we all need each other, you know. You know, it's yeah. in the real estate world, it's a little different than the car world. Real estate world, I can't list all the houses and I can't sell all the houses. So we need each other. You know, in, in, the, in your world, you kind of, you know, you don't, you don't really help each other. Maybe you do refer clients a little bit if it's a different car brand or something like that. But, um, no. yeah, it's probably not. For us, mm. I, I need other agents. You know, if I list a house, and most times I need other agents to show it and sell it. I mean, I show it my, myself and my team, but I don't have all the buyers. And then same thing, if I have a buyer, I need the listing agents. To, I need their houses to sell my buyer. So if we don't build those relationships with each other, it makes that job so much harder. It makes our clients suffer in the process. If there's two real estate agents that don't get along and they're butting heads all day long, that the client loses. So I, I try and make relationships. Relationship with, with my competition is just as important as my relationship with my clients. And, uh, you know, I like to have all the other clients when they see me call, they, hey, how you doing? How you been? Like, you know, like, oh, you want to show my house? Yeah, sure. Keys under the mat. Whereas, you know, if I didn't have the relationship, they might say, yeah, yeah, we'll get away to the open house or, you know, you know, make be nasty about it. So, uh, like I said, the relationships we build, I call myself real estate built on relationships is my tagline and um, relationships over transactions. That's what it's about, right? That's that's how we figured it out. Build relationships. 100%. Sales will come. You you don't need to chase sales. You need to chase the relationship. You know, build friends. Build no love and trust amongst the people you touch every day. You know, I say all the time. You know, put your head on a pillow, knowing that you made the world a better place. Um, you know, that's important. That's important. Try and touch everybody in your life, and just by being a good person, people are going to want to deal with you. And, yeah, uh, just drop the mic right now. It's yeah. it's on. That's it. That's it. Yeah, it's the simplest process. I mean, I, I, I train my team the same way. And uh, I said, even when you presented an offer for a house, I said, call the other agent up. Don't just email an offer and call them up. Talk to them a little bit. Get a feel for them. Build a little no love and trust with the other agent. And now when you put your offer in, you say, hey, listen, you maybe you should go a little bit higher. You're not the highest offer. All right, listen, you know, thanks for the heads up, you know. And that's how you get an offer accepted versus just being cold, sending an email, you know. Okay, nope, not the highest. I'm not going to bother calling you back. We don't have a relationship. Um, you know, so it's the same with, uh, with your car buyers. I mean, I know I have car salesman people up here. There's a guy, Rob, that, I mean, I must have probably sold 30 or 40 cars for him. I should be getting a commission from him, but he always took care of me. Every time someone in my family needed a car, go see Rob. And he always beat every deal. I said, go get your best deal and go to Rob and Rob will beat it. And they dealt on high volume. So he would cut the numbers. And especially I sent him so many people, he'd always make sure he got the numbers to the right point, and uh, always the same thing. If said what he was going to do. Sometimes he'd like, tell you, oh, the payment's going to be 300 a month, and then you go through, oh, well, your credit wasn't any good, so now it's 350 a month. You know, ne never any of those games, you know, the, the bait and switch stuff that goes on that really turns a lot of people off. You know, it's like, yeah. if I promise you a number, this is the number you're going to pay, not, you know, and then I'm going to bring in the sales office, and they're going to try and upsell you for, you know, window etching and everything else that they try and upsell you on in a car deal. And it's like, listen, I don't need any of this stuff. Just, I want, I want to pay my $300 a month and I want to leave, you know? And, uh, he was always good like that. So because of the no love and trust I built with him, I referred him people after people after people because of our relationship and didn't look for anything out of it. Of course, when I went in for my cars, I said, you know, hook me up really good. But and he always did. He always found me like the, you know, one left over from last year that he could take 10 grand off sticker and stuff like that. I mean, I always make killer deals buying cars, but, um, but you're building those relationships with your clients. Your clients are your best referral source. Hundred percent. How many? Yes, sir. How many uh, clients do you have where you sell the whole family cars? You probably have a ton, right? Oh yeah, I've got, I've got one guy that. I'm. It's over a hundred. Wow. Hundred vehicles. Wow. Over the lifetime of our our relationship, um, I've been in the car business for twenty six years, so I have, I have a number of double digit um clients where i've sold you know anywhere from 18 to 30 plus vehicles in their family line but um the, the one guy he he's bought over a hundred i know that for sure that's but uh, him personally or if the referrals you mean like so I'd say 75 for him personally. Wow. And the reason why that even happened though, was years ago, we could, we could sell like cars off of the Buffalo row. So 
he was he's retired and so what he would do is he would come in and he would buy the cars that were in the stones that were leaking oil and what you know just gonna go to the wholesale lot okay go sell at the auction so he would come in and he would you know buy a couple cars off of me um so he's buying your trade-ins off, off you he would go and he would recondition them and resell them. That's, so that's what I used to do. Car. Yeah, I used to grab them from the yeah. local used car dealers. So he would he yeah. would do that, but then um, where that got stopped was was the uh, I don't know. Somebody had a problem with a car that had frame damage, and they were in an accident, and it was sold as is, and so there were some repercussions. So anymore now, a franchise dealership you can buy them off a of mom and pop lots but franchise dealerships are not going to sell a vehicle that's not passed a safety inspection mm -hmm. look like by a certified mechanic just from a liability standpoint so that kind of put a crimp in in that that relationship but he he continued to come back and bring his kids and family other people to to buy cars from me that were um were not the the wholesale or the bone rows yeah um, but yeah numerous numerous times but getting to your point about relationships i mean yeah the, these people look at me as their car guy and they know that i'm going to take care of their kids and they'll drive i've had people drive for two hours I, I live in ohio and i had a client drive from chicago to buy a car from me and it's like man there's so many dealerships between here and chicago it's you know it's a couple three four hour drive but they didn't they didn't care because they knew that I was going to take care of them. And that's that. That's what I'm talking about with the relationship yep. versus transactional. Transactional, somebody walks in the door you've never met before, and then you got to build rapport with them, yep. and you got to talk about all this other stuff and find out what their needs yep. and wants are and all this other bullshit. And I don't, I don't like that. Yep. I mean, I, I see it's necessary for some young salespeople, and I, and I can, and I do in my sales training, I talk about how to do that stuff. But for me personally, I'm too busy. I, I don't I don't have time for that. You know, I, I I will if I have to talk to somebody fresh, if we're overloaded on the floor and I don't have a client in front of me, I will. And then I eventually make them a friend and you know, they, they start doing business with me on the regular. Yep, yep. But I, I prefer to just stay with the people that I know. Yeah, that's a lot of my business already. So I've only been selling auction going into my fifth year of selling. Started flipping about 20 years ago when I was so when I had a bunch of rental properties. So I've been in a real estate game for 20 years or so, but physically got my license and started, you know, being on the retail side and selling. It's been just coming up on five years in the end of April. And I already, a lot of my business is referral business, repeat business. You know, I just went on a house. I sold them the house two years ago and I thought it was a forever house. And I said, you know what? It's too expensive. Long Island area in New York is crazy expensive. Like, you know, what? we want to get out of here. It's way too expensive to live here. They're, they retired now. They have their pensions. They're like, why are we living here? Like, we could live a lot cheaper places and enjoy life, make our money go a lot further. And, um, you know, so I just, and actually I went there um, Sunday morning um, to look at the house. They did a bunch of upgrades to the house since I sold it to them. And next thing you know, three hours later, after having beers in the garage with, uh, with my client, you know, we walked around the house and his actually was funny. His wife went to go see the grandkids. And he's like, hey, you want a beer? And I'm like, yeah, sure, 12 o'clock somewhere. And next thing you know, three beers later, talking about wrestling and playing football and, you know, and just fun stuff. It's just cool people, you know, and it's just like really shooting shooting the shit, as you'd say. Next thing you know, I'm like, man, I got to get out of here. I've been here three hours already and, uh, you know, I get three beers in me and it's like, I got to go, go on with my day. But that's the kind of, you know, that's what I do. And, you know, they may decide not to sell their house. But, you know what, I had a fun afternoon chatting with a friend, you know, that I met through real yeah. estate, you know, and that's... Yeah. That's what I love about the business. It's uh, it's fun to just meet people and learn about their life and their journey and you know their struggles and their wins and uh, you know his, the memories of the past. You know, obviously football wrestling. He was football wrestling himself, and um, you know those type of sports are you know pretty aggressive and and team building and stuff like that. And uh, it was just neat. It was neat. And I sit down. I said I left it. I'm like I just spent three hours there talking to about you know life and whatnot. And but. You know, that's why they called me back after two years to, to help them, you know, and um, it's just fun to have these people in your life. Like I, said, I, I call it my real estate family. It's all these people I've helped. My extended family of choice, my real estate family of choice, as we say. And uh, it's fun. It's fun. You know, 
in the real estate world, you, I get a little more intimate than you do with the cars, but you still, I'm sure people come in, all right, we need a bigger car, we just had more kids, we need more room in the back, we need this, we need that, um, and I get the same thing, all right, you know, I would had a house I sold three years ago, and last summer I sold that house and bought them a bigger house because they had kids now and they needed more space and, you know, they were already on the upgrade, you know, and uh, but they reached out to me because we've stayed in touch all these years and, you know, stayed connected and, uh, you know, wish each other happy birthday and whatnot and, you know, it's uh, it's neat. It's neat, the relationship building. It makes sure. it fun, you know. It's, it doesn't feel like business when you're, when you're building relationships, you know. It's not, you're not fighting for a sale. I'm just, hey... I'm here being your friend, and if I can help you, great. And if I can't, you know, no harm, no foul, you know. And you look at it like that, it really changes your whole outlook on it. It really makes it fun and makes it something you want to do rather than it's not. I don't feel like it's going to work. I enjoy it, you know. If i got to go meet a client early and want to go look at some houses, let's do this. This is fun, you know. So, you know, it doesn't seem like a job. So what else do you want to know about Jerry Gherkin? Uh, so what else do we want to know about Jerry? So you were in the Marine Corps. That's cool. Um, but uh, let's see. What else? Um, what uh, brand cars do you sell now? Uh, I'm, at, I'm at a Kia dealership, but we have uh, <clears throat> seven rooftops. And uh, so we have three Kia uh, and then three Hyundai and then a Cadillac franchise. Okay. But uh, I really, I'm, I'm really diving more into a couple other, uh, other ventures. Um, more about uh, my podcast. I got the Jerry Gherkin show. Yes, I need to get on that still. I know we're gonna pick a time for that. And your yeah. coaching, your, your, your sales coaching is uh, taken off, which um, yeah. is, is pretty cool. Um, Six figure salesperson. Um, so I've got a little private page uh, on Facebook. I've got uh, you can go to sixfiguresalesperson.co uh, and click on that and then you can uh, I've got 10 videos that are for free check that stuff out and the, it's basically an A to Z but they're little snippets they're brief uh, examples of, of how to help salespeople young salespeople veteran salespeople uh, to go through the process uh, just trying to transition um, out of the brick and mortar building and, and do again more about what I'm doing. Um, speaking a lot more. Uh, I've been speaking at the local university quite a bit, uh, working with a bunch of uh, young entrepreneurs. It's coming uh, full speaking. circle, right? You want you want to be a teacher and here you get to be a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, good. Pretty much. I mean, that, that's, that's my life word is yeah. teacher. I don't know if you guys have listened to or, or read the book One Word. Uh, if you haven't, then it's, it's really, really powerful. And you focus on one word for the entire year. And then they wrote a sequel book. It's called life word. And, uh, that forced me to dive deep into who I was and, and what, uh, what, what my life word is and my life word is teacher. So I find myself in, in a lot of, a lot of environments. I mean, all my environments that I'm in, I'm, I'm always trying to add value or pour into um, people that will listen. No, and so there's a lot of teaching moments as we interact with, with other human beings, if you allow it and you're open to it. So, um, so yeah, so working with the public speaking, doing the, the, the talks with the, you know, different, different arenas, working with small businesses, individual, I have individuals that I coach. I've got small businesses that I work with from a sales perspective, but, in my sales training, we talk about more than just the sales. You know, we talk about growing you as a human being mm -hmm. and your personal growth and development and you're establishing your core values. Some of the same things that we've talked about yeah. um, in our group with Apex. But the confidence um, is where I'm it's at, right? I mean, it's, you know, if you're, if you're not strong in yourself and who you are, it's hard to sell. It's hard to connect with people if, if you don't show that confidence if you're not sure of yourself you're not sure of your product how do you get someone to be sure of you and sure of the product you know it's it's it starts from yeah, within i've said i've said if if for a salesperson to dumb it down and just to say hey you know what if you fall short of my expectations i'm walking yeah. if you meet my expectations it's a coin flip if you exceed my expectations i'm buying all day long yeah and and you know people talk about closing all the time close how what's your close how do you close this deal how do you close that deal let's focus on closing 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 
Well, my, my spin is how's your opening? Hmm. I like it. You know, what's, what's the first 90 seconds of that interaction like? Yeah. You know, because, because for me, and I always put myself on the other side of the desk. For me, if, if I walk into Best Buy and I go up to a salesperson and say, hey, I'm interested in that television, and they sound like the parents from the Peanuts cartoon, wah, 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 yeah. wah, wah, wah. I'm turned them off. I'm probably not buying. But if I walk into that Best Buy and I have a salesperson, oh, it's got this many pixels and it's got this, and they start adding and building value and showing attention and energy, excitement, enthusiasm. Yep. Then I'm engaged. Yeah. It's so simple. Yeah. But that's uh, again, that's part of the stuff that I teach. It's so simple it's, stuff. I mean, I've gone to car dealers before. Sometimes you can't get anyone to help you, which I laugh. I'm like, you guys are here on commission. And I'm standing here looking at cars, and you guys are all over there drinking coffee, and you're not even paying attention. So I'm like, well, that's just crazy. Like, come over and ask me if I need anything. And then when they come over and, you know, ask a question, I ask them something about the car. A lot of times I know about the car already because I'm a car guy, and if I'm looking at that car, I already know about the car. So I'll ask them something about it, and they'll be lying. They'll be making stuff up because they don't know their product. And I'm like, are you for real? Like, really? Like, you don't know your own product? You know, it's like, you know, going to look at an Escalade, and it's like telling you what size motor it is, and it, yeah, that's not what size motor is in that truck. Like, you don't know, like, your own product? How, how are you here? Like, you know, it's really, you know. And then the other thing uh, that just came up recently, um, Suki talked about, is presentation. Some of these guys, like, you know, like, they come up to you, or, or women or whatever, and they're a mess. And it's just like, you know, put on a clean pair of clothes, tuck your shirt in, you know, comb your hair. Like, let's look presentable here. And then, we, you know, maybe I'll talk to you about, you know, spending, you know, $50,000 on a car here. Like, you know, it's... You know, it's just reinforcing that stereotype that's already out there. Yeah, like a slime ball kind of salesman. You're clean cut and, you know, dressed nice and well spoken. You know what? I'm probably going to deal with you. But you come in like a homeless person and you know, I'm like, eh. You know, and then if you get into the used car world, then that's even, you know, even worse. Because <laughs> I said, I, I did a lot of car flipping in my day. I uh, probably around 14 or so. Uh, my dad told me basically I had to knock on doors in the neighborhood of cars with no plates in the driveway. You know, if everyone gets a new car, the old car sitting in the driveway, they don't know what to do with it. Back in the day, I'd buy them for 100, 200, 400, 500, and I'd sell them for under 1,000. That was my market. I'd buy them on Saturday, I'd clean them all week, I'd change the oil, I'd clean them up, make them really nice, you know, make the radio work, put a seat cover on it. The seat had to be nice, the radio had to be work, had to be nice, and like, you know, the door handles, all that. So everything they touched all had to be nice. Everything else could be junk, but as long as the radio worked good and the seat was in decent shape, he'd sell them. And they like old station cars, but I was, you know, I'd make 500 to $800 a week, 14, 15 years old flipping cars and then I got hooks with local used car dealers they trade in junk stuff and I'd grab it and clean it up and fix it and you know they'd give them 200 bucks for it I'd give them 400 bucks for it and I'd sell it for 995 that weekend you know and uh it told me a lot the about sales for the listeners you know what they call that hustle yeah yeah you were hustling yeah I was you know and, and that, that's just your example when you were talking about going onto a car lot and then nobody waiting on you I mean, I, yeah, I, no hustle. I, it's still a head, head scratcher for me, but I mean, I get it because it, I tell a story about a flea that can jump three feet in the air. But if you take a tiny little flea and you put them in a mason jar and you put a dozen of them in a mason jar and you put the lid on top, they'll jump and hit the top, jump and hit the top, jump and hit the top. Eventually you can take the lid off and they won't jump out. They're still capable of jumping three feet in the air, but they won't jump out because they've been conditioned to their mm. environment. Yes. So salespeople come in and they can make multiple six figures if they work. But what they're conditioned to is, well, my family, we really only made this kind of money and I'm real comfortable at making X per month so I'm just going to kind of hang out here. And you know what? I've already made that for, so far, even though there's seven days left in the month. Uh, you know, let somebody else have that one. I'll just sit here and drink coffee, read my paper. That's, cel That's celebrating on the uh, one yard line and getting tackled, you know, <laughs> before you hit the end zone. You know, yeah. it's, you see that, right? <laughs> I said analogy. But, that, but that's that's it, man. That that's that's 
what the conclusion yeah. that I've come to with, with our society is there's a small percentage and that's where the 80, 20 rule comes in. You know, 20% of the people do 80% of the yeah. work. Always the other, the other people are, are just satisfied or content with where they're at. Yeah. And I'm like, what's next? What's next? What's yeah. next? No, I can't, you know, and, and I'm beating myself up over having a mediocre month, which a mediocre month to me, blows the doors off of most every other salesperson in the freaking country. Yep. But that's just my level of expectation, my yep. personal level of expectation. It's the overachiever so built on us. Change the mindset, <laughs> yeah. If you can change the mindset. Yeah. Could, you yeah. know, we're in a good enough world, I think, where most people are conditioned it's good enough, right? I mean, you see it every, everything yeah. is done. You know, no one puts their shopping cart away because, you know, we'll just push it over there. It's good enough. No one, you know, holds the door for anyone. Yeah, it's good enough. You know, like, you know, everything in, everything in our society these days is good enough. Everyone's everyone's satisfied with good enough. No one's striving for excellence. And it's sad. It's sad. It's, uh, you know, that's why I really love the idea of Apex where we represent what winning looks like, you know, all the time. Like, set that example of, of what winning looks like. Like, we don't do good enough. We do it all the way, you know, and... Uh, and sometimes I catch myself where I may be saying something's good enough, and I'm like, no, finish it, do it right, you know, or don't do it. You know, do it right or don't do it. You know, don't do it halfway. I said, and don't do anything half-ass. You got to do everything full-ass. You know, because uh, you know, half-ass doesn't get you anywhere. It's half-ass. You know. Well, it's oh. part-time goals versus full-time goals too. I mean, yeah. you, you, your part-time goals are the things that eh, I'll get to it. I'll work on it. You know, I don't, I don't really have time today, but you know, I'd really like to have that and accomplish this, but I, right today, it's just not really, you know, it's part-time goals versus full-time goals. Yeah. And if you would really commit to your full-time goals, you do crazy, amazing things, but we, we can talk all day long about this stuff, but it's whether or not people are going to do it. And that goes back to that 80, 20, but yeah. And wherever I think I, uh, the why I think I go, is big. there I am. Yeah, it's true. It's true. The why I think is bigger for some people than others. You know, I mean, you know, maybe you got six kids that you got to pay for versus someone that doesn't have any kids. You know, and you know the why may be be greater. You know, um, I don't know. I was brought up in a hardworking family. My dad, you know, uh, a union sheet metal worker worked. You know, every you know every chance overtime he could get. Uh, the minute he could, he opened his own company. Uh, back in the 80s, the market crashed. He failed, started over again, went back to work for someone, came back, started another company. Uh, that company was struggling. He went to merge with another company. Um, then that company, um, his partner retired. The sons got involved. Uh, just He kind of felt like it was out of control and he didn't want to do it anymore. So he bailed out of that company and started his third company, which is the current one that's still going. And I've been there in feast or famine. I've been there when, you know, you know, we're buying new Cadillacs to bill collectors are coming and we can't put food on the table to we're buying new Cadillacs to you know I've been on that roller coaster ride my whole life and I've it's it's taught me a lot about business in the world and you know a lot of it was uh, you know um, you start making it and then you, you you don't save for the rainy day you know you think the good times are gonna last forever and they don't you know we get that rough 10-year cycle of crash and burn in our economy and uh, you know you start leasing trucks and leasing equipment and getting bigger buildings and all this other stuff and all of a sudden the work stops and it's like you know it's like uh when the music stops there's no chairs left you know and um so i've learned that in my life that i try and keep my overhead and just my personal life down because if the times pull back you know you get stuck with the bill and there's no one to pay it so uh you know life lessons that we learned along the way um and the other thing is taking the edge off um mike claudio has got a <clears throat> i think about it all the time when you do good, you go out and celebrate, you know, you take the edge off. When you're, when you're upset and you didn't make any sales, what do you do? You go out and have a drink, you take the edge off. And every time you take that edge off, you get less sharp. And you get more conditioned and you get more average and you get more, lose some drive. And, um, and you think about that through your life as, as I'm sure, as you know, when you're hitting the bottle and taking the edge off, you wind up uh, a round stone with no sharp edges left and uh, you don't have much effect on the world anymore. And uh, I just think it's such a great analogy, you know, soul blade. Every time you take the, take the edge off one of those teeth, it doesn't cut as good anymore the second time around. And uh, it's something to think about every time we go out and get drunk and go out and do whatever we're doing. It's, you know, that bad habit that a lot of us have had or still have. Um, 
we're just you know we're dulling ourselves out we're not as effective as we could be you know you wake up with a hangover you're definitely not as effective as you were without the hangover you know and we all of us i think have learned that lesson <laughs> one too many times yeah and we're you know we're on our own our own worst enemies in a lot of cases but um yeah it only takes uh, our lives to get a life education right <laughs> It only takes a million dollars to get a million dollar education. It only takes a whole life to get a lifetime experience. But, I love it. Yeah. But, uh, all right. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, all right. So, how do you want the world to remember Jerry? What do you want to be known for? Oh, well, it's so funny you asked that question because I just had um, Mark... Zelmanoff on my podcast a few weeks ago. Love Mark. And I always ask at the end of my podcast, how do you want to be remembered? And he threw me the biggest curveball. I mean, I've had all different kinds of answers to that question. He threw me the biggest curveball and he said, nobody's going to remember me. He said, you know, maybe two or three generations maybe but then after that i'm going to be in the wind and it took me a minute to recover from that comment because i was like this motherfucker's right mm. um but he wrote a book you know and i told him i said you know what that's a great point but the book that you you're a published author, you have a best selling book. That's going to be something that will be there forever. And so you will be remembered for the content in that book. And so to answer your question, Brian, I want to be remembered by the content that I put in the books that I'm writing. I've, mm -hmm. I've got my first book is in the publish, publishing and editing right now. It's my life story. My next book am in the works right now. And it's the best piece of advice you ever received because I ask every one of my guests, what's the best piece of advice you ever received? And I have over a hundred episodes of my podcast. And so I have all this content from different people awesome. that have different best pieces of advice and it's it's going to be a lot easier than the first one because when you deep dive into yourself and you're trying to extract all this shit it it, it sucks mm. it's tough because a lot of the stuff that's hidden deep down and you forgot about yeah because you covered it up and you just want to cope a different way but um so so through the content i put in my book yeah, I like that. It's, it's what's going to live on forever. And you think about, right, some of the stuff in your family history of, like family heirlooms and stuff that makes people remember stuff. So that your books are basically going to be a family heirloom to your kids, your grandkids, and all the way down the line. This was Grandpa Jerry's book, you know, and this is what he stood for. And it's kind of neat. I like I like to leave a legacy. Um, There's a thing in Disney years ago. Uh, I think it's when you go into Epcot, and it was leave a legacy, and it was a put it like an inch like a little picture of your face type thing and on the wall and you know we go back for generations and generations and there's you know mom and dad grandma grandpa you know it's just kind of a neat thing and it's that term leave a legacy is really stuck in my head of what is my legacy like what what are we leaving behind that people are going to remember us by what's making us not average you know, what's making us stand out in the crowd what's making us be the you know people that are changing the world and i think that's where we connect and, and a lot of us in apex connect is that we actually want to leave a legacy. We don't want to just be, you know, average person in the crowd doing average things and average life. And uh, we want to stand out and make a difference in the world. And, and uh, you know, and that's the stuff that we do, writing books and getting live on Facebook and and all the crazy stuff that we do to, to try and make a difference in the world and try and share our ideas and thoughts. And it's just awesome. And I think it's, we, we align a lot like that. Like I said, uh, I know you're, you're a Christian man and a holy man, and I think that's... Uh, important in life you know uh i say prayers every morning on my uh my live message of the day and i've had some people comment to me oh you know you think it's too much and then i got a message last night from 
uh, a guy that's uh, my parents' neighbor growing up. He's probably, I don't know, late 20s or whatever. And he messaged me and says, I just saw your mom the other day and I told her how much I love your messages and I love that you pray in your messages. I'm, you know, I'm a man of faith and uh, I just think it's important to keep that, keep that alive, keep going. And it's like, you know, sometimes God gives you signs when you're doubting yourself and boom, there it is, you know. And, uh, you know, I know you post a lot of stuff. You're not afraid to share it either. And uh, listen, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a God out there that's making stuff happen for us. So, uh, you know, that's it. Got to gotta respect that and uh, acknowledge that, right? So, yeah, um, 100%. Yeah. So that's and, a, and, you know, and, and it's really cool when you get a little bit of feedback because that's all you need. Yeah, could be because the 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 little chatter box in the back of your brain starts to talk, yeah. and you know it's it's what, or is this really affecting anybody? Is this really doing anything? And then all of a sudden, um, God shows up, it's, it's and he wild. puts a couple going. posts in there, or a couple comments, or or you get a message, and then it's just like. I remember years ago, I used to go fishing uh, at the reservoir and I would sit there for hours and hours and hours and then the bobber wouldn't move. And then I would be getting ready to get up and leave. And then the bobber would just twitch just a little bit. And I'm like, oh, there's maybe something there. And so then I would stick around for another two hours, you know, and it's like trying to <laughs> catch this fish. It's so true. And so the same thing with, with the analogy is, is, you know, you, you keep doing these things because you on a good faith you feel that it's making an impact but when there's no feedback it's like is this really is anybody but trust me people are watching hmm. just because they don't comment doesn't mean they're not watching or getting some kind of effect out of what you're doing yeah. and then but it's just that little bit of extra appreciation that comes through that is is enough to reef fill your tank so 100%. that you keep pressing on and going. Fills your bucket forward. up so you can pour out a little bit more. That's uh talk about a lot what Stacy Rasky when we go to her events. You can't you can't operate with an empty bucket. Your bucket's gotta be full. You gotta your bucket's yeah. gotta be full and, and secure and then you can help other people. And back to like what you said, if if your core values are messed up and, and you're not confident in yourself, how do you help people around you? So you gotta build yourself first and then and then outpour into people and I think it's so important. That's why we continually on on our journeys together of making ourselves better, making our friends better, and you know making the world better. And uh, that's uh, that's what we're all about. All right. So you said you got all this advice. So what's the number one advice now from all these uh, hundred episodes that you did? Oh man. And then we'll, then we'll close it up for tonight because we're running in, running out of time here. Yeah. So the best piece of advice I ever received. And it's not from my episode, it's for, it's was given to me, was my college wrestling coach's dad. And he owned a bar, it's called the Euler Pizza Pub. And I was coaching wrestling at a local high school and I was a assistant coach. And I came in to talk to Tom and I was whining to him about this teacher who has never wrestled a day in his life but because he's a teacher he is the coach he's the head coach mm. and i was a college all-american and i'm running this wrestling room like a well-oiled machine and he's trying to tell me what to do and so i was whining to tom about him like dude this guy's and and he with here's the wisdom he goes you like some of the things that he does and i said well yeah he's really good at organization he's really good at scheduling he's really good at you know, making sure everybody, all the, you know, certifications are in line. He's like, okay. He's like, but some of the things you don't like, I'm like, no, he can't fucking run a room, man. He's just like, he, he doesn't understand that part of it. He's like, okay. So here's where the advice comes in. He said, you're going to interact with a number of different people throughout your life. You're going to have people that are from all the walks of life. You're going to interact with them. You're going to, like some things that they do and you're going to dislike some things that they do replicate the things that you like discard the stuff that you don't and that's going to make you the human being that you are today and moving forward and that's the i've adopted that philosophy yeah. and this was in this was 25 years maybe ago 26 27 years ago yeah so i always look at every person or every encounter as and it doesn't matter age I mean, I can, I can learn from a freaking 15 year old, it doesn't matter, yeah. you know, but, but I take away the stuff that I like and I replicate it 
or duplicate it and the stuff that I don't, I don't do. I like it. I call that uh, baking a cake. I had a morning message about that, about God gives us all the ingredients we need to bake a cake. And, you know, he gives us the pan, gives us the flour, gives us the eggs, gives us all the stuff we need to make a cake. And it's up to us, basically, to make the cake. And sometimes God gives us everything we need to make the cake, and you walk out of the kitchen without a cake, even though you had all the ingredients you need. Or sometimes you take everything you need that God put in front of you, and you put it all together, and you bake a cake. And I just thought that was a cool analogy. I thought about it one more, and I'd heard it somewhere, and I was like, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Sometimes we have everything we need in front of us, and we just walk out of the kitchen and other times we you know big, big the big the big wedding cake you know six tiers high you know so uh this is a cool analogy good stuff i love it great advice great advice all right jerry so i appreciate you coming on this was uh, a great show i always love chatting with you uh down in uh probably another what two months out till we get back to texas again and yeah. uh yep. get to go to ida claire for a beer 100 <laughs> percent. That's, that's, man. that's it that's it all good stuff. Jerry, uh, I appreciate you uh, coming on the show. I appreciate your wisdom. And uh, So where can everyone find you? That's uh, Six Figure Sales Person. Six Figure Sales Person dot co. Dot co. C-O. Okay. Yeah. And, or if they just want to jump in my DM and then I can send them an attachment um, to that website and that'll get them right to the uh, free sales training uh, you and can't then, beat that uh, free sales training. I think anyone that's in sales should definitely take advantage of that. Yeah, it's, so it's, we'll push that it's out. It's good stuff. Yeah, for sure. All right, you're on Instagram uh, is Jerry Gherkin, obviously Facebook Jerry Gherkin, and everywhere else in between, I'm sure. So, um, all right, Jerry, I appreciate you. Have a great night. Thanks for coming on, and uh, we'll see you in Texas. All right. All right. All right, brother. Peace. Thanks, Brian. Peace.